gentlemen, join Mythician's Patreon, not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier, all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars and you're helping Myth Vision grow. Thank you, gentlemen, once again. I, I seriously appreciate this. Let's get right into it. Christians have said over and over and over, this dying and rising God thing has been debunked since the 1900s, Dr. Carrier. You're like way, way past the deadline of this thing. It's already been disproven. When William Lane Craig went up there and debated Dr. Uh, Robert M. Price on this topic, and he said, that, oh, this, come on, are you kidding me? This is a 150-year-old myth itself of dying and rising God. And Jesus has nothing to do with that. Yeah. Well, you wrote on this and you did a fan. Yeah, uh, I've done. And, and actually, it, this is another example of where our younger scholars are starting to like get on board with this. Uh, there was a big trend against it to try and oppose it. And it was largely uh, based on misrepresentations of even what the thesis was. So to get people squared away here, the, the idea is that the, the idea of dying and rising deities, particularly sons of God, uh, in some cases daughters of God, was a ubiquitous fashion. It was a trope at the time. It's very common, tons of different examples all over the Mediterranean, ancient Near East and beyond. Um, so that when you suddenly see Jesus as a dying and rising son of God, when you look in context, that's like, you know, uh, John Wick part seven or something. Like it, it's, it's been done a million times, right? So, so it, it doesn't suddenly look strange at all. It's not like some new radical idea. Um, now, it is true, like certain aspects of this come from Judaism. Judaism had adopted their idea of resurrection from Zoroastrian, actually. It comes from Persian, the Persian conquerors. Uh, they get the idea of resurrection, and so they have their own particular models and ideas and concepts of resurrection. And then those get imported onto Jesus. But the general idea of he dies, he is dead, he comes back to life and is now alive, right? And, and so that, like, that model, no matter how it's done, whether it's in the same body or different bodies, or whether it's as a baby or as an adult, or whether how you're killed, like, it doesn't matter. All those are little particulars uh, that only instantiate the general mytheme. The general mytheme is there is a death, they are dead, and then they are alive again. And that's, and, and, and bodily, like, well, we can be that specific. So they, they do understand this as a bodily resurrection. It's not souls going off to heaven. A resurrection is really coming back from the dead uh, in, in a literal sense, even in the pagan world. So when the Christians go around spreading this idea, they have a ready audience that are already, they get it. They under, oh, yes, I understand what you're talking about. Uh, and even in the sense that we're selling you this idea to prove to you that you too can rise from the dead and you can have an afterlife, a good afterlife. That was also familiar. All these other mystery religions had the same thing. They're savior cults. You can have a great afterlife. Now, they weren't all resurrection cults. Uh, they might have a resurrecting God narrative as their salvation narrative, but the salvation being offered might have been more specific, like you'll get a nice apartment in heaven or something, right? So it, it depends on what the specific mystery cult was, but they were all offering salvation in the afterlife of some kind. And they were all, many of them, not all of them, many of them are offering it on a model of a dying and rising God. Uh, and to be clear here, I want to like make sure we don't... Uh, give too much cover to false ideas of this. So Horus is not a dying and rising god. Mithras is not a dying and rising god. Their narratives are different. They're similarities, but they're not dying and rising gods. And they are salvation cults related to these. But, um, but that's, that's different. We're, when we're talking about dying and rising gods, we're talking about actual dying and rising gods. We have actual ancient pre-Christian evidence. It's, and you know, one of the arguments will be like, well, maybe the pagans borrowed it from the Christians. It doesn't make sense because the pagans hated the Christians. I don't know why they would borrow it. But, uh, but we have actual evidence that predates Christianity, so we know for a fact that this happened. And so there is pushback on this idea, um, but the latest scholarship is really showing that that pushback is unreasonable. It's, it's denying evidence. It's making the same kind of rhetorical mistake of focusing on particulars and ignoring the mytheme. That's right. right. Uh, so, so it's the same kind of strategy. It's more of a rationalization to deny facts rather than accepting the reality of what's going on here. Um, and one of the examples of these, uh, it, so one of the recent studies that kind of 
reversed the course of scholarship on this was Mettinger. So Mettinger, uh, I might not be pronouncing his name correctly, but uh, he wrote a book on the riddle of resurrection. He wrote actually a few books on this, but the riddle of the resurrection is one of them where he goes over all the ancient Near Eastern narratives. This is pre-Hellenistic, right? So this is, we're talking pre-500 BC stuff. Uh, and he, he shows like, no, there's all these dying and rising gods even then. Um, now he's writing for a context that's long predates Christianity by hundreds of years. Uh, and these are not mystery cults that he's talking about. He's talking about these are, you know, old a a ancient Near Eastern uh, religions, usually agricultural cults. Is this like what Derek Bennett did when he talked about Baal, like the Baal resurrection? Yeah, but they're right. The, 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 right, exactly. There, Cyrus. Right. There are some Baal narratives that are clearly dying and rising God narratives. Right. Totally true. Probably agricultural themed. Right. Um, so this is pre-salvation cult, right? So... There's a thing that happens after. So people will say, well, Mettinger, these aren't, these, look how different these gods are. Maybe even if they are dying and rising gods, um, they're too different and they're too far away from Christianity to have influenced it. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but that's, he's only studying a different period. You have to then, well, then go through the next 500 years, right? So if you go, what happens after? He goes up to like, you know, 500 BC. Now, what does the literature show in the next 500 years? Well, it shows these gods, many of them, evolve into these salvation cults that are populating the whole world. And then, boom, Christianity comes along in exactly that context. And if you look at the Jews, when the Israelites, when they were conquered by Persia and they adopted, they adopted the idea of Satan, they adopted the idea of a burning hell, they adopted the idea of resurrection, the, the, apoc the apocalypse, linear history, they got all of that stuff from the Zoroastrian idea of, you know, there's gonna be an end times, there's gonna be a general resurrection, all Zoroastrian, all pagan ideas. And they brought, borrowed it from their conquerors at the time. So your, your conquerors have all these great ideas. We have a great religion. Why doesn't our religion have these great ideas? Well, clearly our God must have thought of it too. And so when, here, there you get it, right? Now, what do we have? We have the Jews get, the Israelites get conquered by the Greeks and then the Romans. And so they have different conquerors. What is their great sell? Well, these cultures come along with these salvation cult ideas, the sons of God that died and rise or had some sort of passion through which they gain power over death and they, they sell it to their followers. And Romulus. So there's, right, well, we can get into that at some point. But, <laughs> <We will. laughs> but that's all, so, so it's, this is the same context. So it doesn't, it totally fits context that they would borrow these ideas, Judaize them. They're not claiming they stole them. They're claiming that they had, they were in Judaism all along, right? There's, so, so it's like this, you know, the resurrection, they claim that that was always a Jewish idea and it was always always in the scriptures or whatever. Uh, and so that's what the Christians did. They did the exact same thing. And, and it makes a marketable religion in context. And yeah, it, it is also, it's very congealed with, very coherent with the Jewish expectation of the apocalypse, uh, which is one of the reasons it was such a great idea at the time. So, so it totally makes sense uh, in context. And so the reason why there's pushback doesn't make any sense. They're, these are people who are not looking at the evidence or are distorting the evidence when they do because they're dead set against denying that this is the case because they don't want Christianity to, they want Christianity to be unique, some sort of powerfully unique religion that isn't, uh, it, it was coming up with some new great idea that no one else had thought of before. Yeah. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, no, it's, it very much is a creation of its time. Dennis, would you like to maybe tack on to this some? I mean... Uh, I would, but I, I want to come at it in a rather different way. Of course, yeah. Some would suggest that this more history of religions way of understanding the importance of this myth theme is the transitions from one culture to another are sometimes very thin in terms of evidence. So we don't know the mechanisms. We can see similarities between Zoroastrianism and early Christianity and some Egyptian religion and so on, and the, the Greeks. But there's, a, 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 I think, a legitimate academic contestation about what are the mechanisms for the transmission yeah, of these. How did it happen? What is how the specific happen, causal route? Which is earlier and so on. So um, I tend to be more skeptical, probably, than Richard is on the, um, the history, so-called history of religions way of understanding this issue. So I want to come at it just a little differently, which is not an argument against it. Right. It's just a it's question. It's a different way to it. Yeah. It's a different way to it. And I want to start with Joseph Campbell in The, the Hero of a, with a Thousand Faces, which uh, we mentioned in an earlier taping. And very simply put, 
I, um, Joseph Campbell holds to a Jungian understanding of universal consciousness and argues that the primary mythic pattern is very simple. It goes from a time of relatively peaceful stasis to liminality, often caused by um, opposition or illness or some tragedy. And as a result of that, the individual who survives it is stronger, and then it's, it has not a tragic line, it has a comedy line, namely there's this restoration of um, the positive and even stronger because of having gone through, if it doesn't kill you, it strengthens you, something like that, right? And he shows that it's so fundamental to the major stages of human life. We go from the mother's womb into the liminality of being on our own and crying and needing nourishment, and then going through life and getting stronger and stronger and stronger so that we come out of that liminality stronger. It happens in when young people leave home they go to school, um, they're protected at home, all of a sudden they're in a college dormitory, they aren't, they're not going to pass their calculus exam, um, but through that, that ordeal they become stronger and they become adults and so on. And he argues that the same thing happens in every culture in this uh, subconscious of going from life to death and then the pattern is the, a restoration after death of something that's actually better than life. And you see this in Plato, for example. Now, I really do think that it would be surprising if early Christians did not have some kind of um, a, a seminal figure to represent that pattern of moving from liminality mm -hmm. to um, through crisis to salvation anyway. And of course, Jesus was considered by many to have been a valued Jewish teacher and suffered great liminality. Namely, he was crucified for his vision and it caused a crisis of um, understanding. And, and, and so you have this understanding of um, a resurrection, which is there in not just the subconscious, but also in the the tradition, explicit so, Jewish cultural understanding that's that is immediately available. It's an, it's, a, it's available, but it also is available in the Greco-Roman world, and in we, we we can talk about Romulus at some point, but we also have it. And early Christians said, just as Heracles had a terrible death and became an Olympian, <laughs> so Jesus died and um, is glorified. The, um, the same thing with Dionysus. Dionysus is killed by Titans and he, he's restored in life um, and um, is, is also uh, an Olympian. So that um, in this case, we don't have to talk about missing cultural links from one culture to another in the history of religions um, way which has its own legitimacy, but there it is hard to chain those ideas together. Um, and in some cases, there seem to be missing links, in my view, that it, some, some are stronger than others. But certainly with these um, Christians, you have inside of Judaism and in the Greco-Roman world, in, at the same time, this very satisfying myth of restoration, of that death is, a tragic death is not the end. And in the Greeks, uh, Greek world, sometimes that would, that eterna, the, um, uh, it would be renowned. If you had a tragic death like Achilles, you'll be remembered forever. If you have this tragic death, you'll be king, king, king of the dead and so on. So uh, my understanding is less history of religions than it is this um, psychological need that people have 
to make sense of tragedy. And um, it's virtually universal. Now, the shortcoming in, you know, of um, Joseph Campbell is that he didn't account for sociological differences and cultural differences between, so it all becomes a monomyth and it becomes a little like oatmeal. Uh, you know, zeitgeist of its own type of thing. Uh, it, it, you say? Well, it's yeah, I've it's seen show, uh, yeah. I know, I absolutely know what you're talking about. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rag on Campbell nearly as bad as Zeitgeist, but it, 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 it these are different errors happening here. Um, but yeah, it, he's he's seeing it from his own cultural perspective and laying that on all cultures. Okay. Every culture is going to be different, and so the the actual materials available for you conceptually to build one of these myths is going to vary. In context, that's right. so um, so that's the thing that he that he didn't take into account because I mean he was Jungian, so Carl Jung had really weird ideas about how this works. But <laughs> that's a causal uh, system that we do not I do not accept. So uh, I'm definitely not a Jungian uh, yeah, about yeah. this. No, I, what I, the way I see it is similar to what Dennis just said. Is uh, and let's assume historicity for a moment, right? Because right. because it, it this is about resurrection. It doesn't matter whether Jesus existed or not. So even if Jesus was a man and died tragically in exactly that way, um, you have people cognitive dissonance. You have, you know, what is the um, when prophecy fails? That book, right? It's yeah. about co that's how the idea of cognitive dissonance yeah, right. is example. originally developed. Um, is this whole idea? Okay, we know that the usual very our very common response. I would maybe usual is not the right word, but definitely a common response to this is not what we expect. Is not res resignation and failure and running away. Uh, very often, people double down. They come up with a new myth to explain and valorize the heroes. They know this death wasn't tragic. It was actually great and wonderful, and here's why. You know, the, whatever the tragedy is. And there's been many Sabbatai Sevi, and there's been various other examples that you could point to um, yeah, that's a good about this. Too, but yeah. um, so, so the, these what will what will happen? So you're in this situation. You've got cognitive dissonance. You're going to reach around. Uh, well, maybe reach in your head, but your head is full of tropes and full of culture. Uh, of things that you know, models that you've seen and are familiar with. So what is the cultural material available to you? Uh, and even Jews in Judea will be familiar with, at this point, uh, the pagan models. Um, they definitely would know this, even if they didn't like them. They, would, the they would be aware of right. them. Well, yeah, you have, you have uh, Hellenistic um, traders. You have uh, Jews from the diaspora, pilgrims, pilgrimages back, taking pilgrimages back. They're taking ideas with them. Uh, Greek traders are taking ideas with them. Uh, Jews interact with uh, God fearers. It's another example uh, who are Gentiles who are interested in Judaism and they're also in Judea. Uh, cities around the Decapolis and Tyre and various, they, these are full of these sects. Uh, so they know, they know the cultural model, the pagan cultural model exists. But they also have the Jewish model, right? They have this Jewish idea of a resurrection, and, the end, and it was associated with the end times. So the end times is going gonna, is gonna to be a resurrection and so on. And you see already in Paul, he's saying that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. So he sees this as the beginning of the general resurrection, right? He sees it as part of the whole thing. That's why he thinks the end is not nigh, right? And I don't think Paul is inventing this. I think this is the early Christian sect themselves. They converted the death of Jesus into the basically the signal, the sign that the end has come. And, and the idea that Jesus has been resurrected confirms this to them because, it's, oh, the general resurrection has started. Our Lord has been resurrected. He's going to give the same thing to us. We now have to get the message out because the end is coming any time now. Like, so so they're, they're looking for, when they build this, this solution in their heads, they're going to use the materials that's available to them. And this comes from Judaism and it comes from the surrounding pagan ideas. And when they see a congruence between the pagan models and the Jewish model, then that... To, would be an example of something telling them this is some sort of universal truth that God is communicating in the world, so it must be true, right? So even having the the pagan models, it's not like they like looked at a specific sect and said we're going to make Jesus a model out of that. Yeah. They see the model in generic terms, right? So they they know there's an Osiris, they know there's a you know a Baal, they know there's all these different resurrected uh, Hercules, Dolcanus, and and all these others. Um, Romulus is another example. So they they know all of these models exist, and so they see the commonalities. So what what is in their head is the commonalities, the themes, not necessarily the specifics, right? They're not interested in the specifics. They're interested in the theme, and they see the theme is coming from their own God in their own scriptures or in the way they believe it. So they, they see this as a universal truth. So this, to them, is going to be an obvious model to borrow from to create a solution to the problem that's, that's confronted them. So in the historicity model, it's very plausible in context that they would come up with a resurrection belief. 
justify it and go and this would motivate them even more to go forth and sell it and try and convert people. I had an interesting question earlier and me and Dennis were trying to wrap our heads around it. And I think it was from Dr. Price to Dennis, but <laughs> me and Dennis were like, I don't know. We weren't sure if there's something here. Maybe I can pose it here because it was just a toss away. We really didn't know what to do with it. Maybe you have some insight on this. And he says, and I'm just going to give you like in a nutshell what, what we have here. Mm -hmm. Um, I have read Titus 2.12, continued in Acts 17.28, uh, preserve, or I have read that Titus 2.12, continued in Acts 17.28, preserves portions of a poem credited to Epimenides re rebutting the Cretan belief that Zeus had been gored to death by a boar like Adonis and that pilgrims were shown the god's tomb. No, says the poem, he arose. I also have read that Dionysus means young Zeus. If this is so... Is it a vestige of the belief that Zeus was resurrected, i.e. reborn? Do you think Paul's harping on this resurrection, reborn by quoting Epimenides? I honestly can't evaluate that because there's there's so many claims and statements in there that I would have to fact check yeah, before I, I could even yeah. begin to that's evaluate why, that's that. Why I, um, um, the, okay. the only thing I can comment on there is that Dionysus is, is Dios, Nusos. It is actually something similar to young young Zeus, right? So, so there, there is truth in that. Okay. Um, cause the Dios is, is another form of Zeus. Ask, but no worries. Don't want to rabbit trail. Right. And there was a legend of Zeus being killed and, and, and there, the tomb being shown and, and so, and there are poems by Epimenides about it, but I, uh, the, so there's some things there that are true, but I, the rest of it, there's a lot of connections being made there that I'm not sure hold up. Uh, I can't vouch for it. It's interesting. Here's, um, a question. I'm, I'm going to go back to an earlier, uh, a statement that you made. And it's a question that I raise with my seminary students when we talk about these things. And is the resurrection of Jesus important to you because it's unique and only Jesus rose from the dead? Or is it important because it's the Christian variation of a universal need for uh, handling tragedy and and uh, and finding salvation, and I said, for me, the function of the myth is not to show that Jesus is unique, but that Christians shared in the human need for restoration and mm -hmm. redemption. And what's happened, I think, is that the focus on Christology and the uniqueness of Jesus has really blinded us to the universality of the mythologies of Jesus. <laughs> and th that can preach in a very different way. Yeah. So uh, on the one, do you, you understand what I'm trying to I do, to get yeah, to I know. I think you totally make sense, yeah. And it's, it's a way of getting students to think, are you going to preach at Easter that only Jesus is the one who has eternal life and, and has life? Or and makes it available to others, or are you going to say that this is a part of universal experience of trying to make sense out of tragedy? I would love to see that become what happens, because anyone can do that with any story at that point, which then creates connectiveness among. That's a, a very good observation. Yeah. We can walk into a place and go, we know that this is just us as humans connecting narrative-wise in the same struggle. And we want to paint a narrative we can all agree in this particular way. Yeah, on. I mean, uh, that's obviously, not what we see. that is not what happened. And this, we already see in the second century I wish that this was. this tendency to to um, what do we call it? to make this a controversial issue. This is where the Christians are saying it, it's important to our success. They've decided to declare all the other religions false. Therefore, all the other resurrections false. The devil did it, as Justin Martyr says. Um, in order to, so that our religion will be successful, so that our values will be adopted. Uh, and and you know, one could also argue that our churches will get the money and, and so on. So you know, there's other motives here, but even if you think of it as a righteous motive, that it's our value system is the only value system that can save society. Mm -hmm. The only way people will adopt our value system is if they believe our guy is the only real one. Ergo, we have to defend Jesus as unique. Uh, and that's, I think, kind of the whole history of Christianity here in a nutshell is driven by this idea that our values have to beat out all other values. Therefore, our story has to be true and every other f story false. 
Even and that's what you get. Even the New Testament, right? You bring up second second century, which you're right. There's in group, out group stuff right here. When I read uh, Zvi Benit and uh, Adio Fear, uh, Rosen, Rosenfi, not Zvi Benit, but um, Rosenfi, Adio Adio Fear and Ishai Rosenfi. Sorry, they wrote a book called Goy, and oh, it's all about the Gentiles, the others, right? Mm-hmm. And they go into this history, like all the way back, right? As mm-hmm. far as you can go, they go into the Greek stuff and show like. There's even the Goyim, the nations, but in Greek, it's the ethne, ethnos yeah. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they go into like the history of this term being used biblically. Then they go down into the first century, how Paul does this. He does a strange individual usage of the term, which made it really, really, is it syncratic? Is it diacratic? I don't even know the diachronic. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, these are like syncratic technical. Or diachronic, yeah. Right. And you, you know, like what's going on and Christine Hayes and all these people are like really involved in this discussion. But when you get to the second century, it's no longer Jew and Gentile necessarily from the church. It's heathen or Christian. And yeah. like they do this in-group, out-group thing the whole time. But mm-hmm. Paul's already set in the stage when he's like, oh, you foolish Galatians. Like, I wish Dennis was right. And this is what someone came, kicked every Christian's ass and said, stop. Okay, that's not the message. The message right, yeah. is a shared mythos right. of struggle in human consciousness, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't even get woo-woo about it. It's just the fact that we actually connect as humans in this experience we have, and this is what we're trying to achieve. Here's our common myth. We call it a myth, and we're okay with that. We yeah. don't think it's some superior thing. We just think this is something we all experience, and we can connect on the same narrative. But that see, would be this made. is why social identity theory is important, that the myth becomes functional to support the in-group against the out-group. Yeah. And so your leader has to be the one who has the special divine privileges. That's right. Yeah. And you, you demonize and stereotype the out-group because it gives you the mirror image of yourself. Yeah, right. See, but that's yeah. why what you're saying makes so much sense about this whole thing. Like why it happens. Much. Yeah, we know they why They memorize it or they make it more and more historical because... I mean, if we all share in the common thing, there's, it's like what happened to me when I deconverted. I started to go, okay, I saw these patterns that you guys are talking about. Not all of them, of course. I haven't read everything you've read, but it's like, mm-hmm. I started seeing it. I'm like, why do I think Jesus is the one and only, you know? So I started going, maybe, right. and this was what happened to me. I had a God concept and it was a very, very strict, very concentrated God who controlled my every move. I thought he's looking down at me and the bad things I did and oh man, mm-hmm. uh, whatever it might be. I was shunned in my own head. Well, when I started to realize that this is everywhere, I went, hold on. God, <laughs> you'll see where my, my mind went. God is in all the cultures, and he's bigger than Christianity. <laughs> right, but here's yeah. what happened when I did that. When I brought in my whole perspective, it lost its power in yes, my life. And, and yeah, yeah. Right. It does. So it was like, okay, now. Which is what strength. Christians fear, right? right? That's, that's, that's right. what they're yeah. afraid of. Yeah. Well, that's because it's true. And that's the yeah. problem. Well, yeah. It's like, once you do it... Everybody fears the truth, yeah. That's... It's, it's, it's Pringles. Once you pop, the fun don't stop. That's, that's all I have to say. You know? <laughs> uh, gentlemen, we got two, two minutes. Any closing words? I think I would like to be generous to people who are afraid of the ambiguities of the world and to cling to these myths in special ways because it allows them to make sense of the craziness of what it means to be a human being. And I think there are psychological benefits to holding to mythic ideas, and the resurrection is one. Um, And what you experienced is the anxiety of existence when you said, when you realize that things are universal and that you didn't, your special a uh, little piece of uh, fundamentalist Christianity didn't work for you. It was freeing, but that freedom comes at a cost of anxiety. And the reason we have social identity um, in religion is that people want other people to share their mythologies so they're not so afraid in the universe. Mm-hmm. And wow. that is also a universal impulse. I'm afraid of the ambiguities of the universe and, and climate change and racism and the, our inability to get a hold of what it means to be human and compassionate. And I think we can talk about myth negatively, but I think that there's something that has to do with human meaning 
in 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 meaning making through mythology that helps us cope with the dangers of being humans in the universe. 20 seconds. And my view on that is we can get this out of fiction and we can do a whole thing about how Blade Runner, I think, does the same kind of thing that you're talking about as a movie. We don't have to believe it's true to get the message and to be comforted and even motivated by that message. Absolutely. Thank you.